So eBIC is based on the Harwell site. So yeah, it's that one. So you can see the main synchrotron here. So this is diamond. So we're in a little building here, which also has a beam line running from the synchrotron to it. So we share this facility with um, hard X-ray nanopro beam line and also uh, physical sciences EM center. So EPSIC. Uh, so Diamond's on quite a large campus. We have quite a number of facilities. So ISIS is the uh, neutron source. We've got the central laser facility for high-end laser. And then we've got technology. Um, we've got NMR. There's a computer center. And then there's various um, other entities. So CCPM are local on site. And we have yeah 12,000 registered users and over 9,000 user visits a year. Um, so we, Diamond itself currently has 32 operational beam lines, I think, and we obviously have a operational uh, cryo EM facility. So EBIC was originally set up, so people have seen this slide far too many times, so let's not spend too long on So free at the point of access, run like a beam line. Um, we are trying to maintain our relevance by having in-house research, so that's with uh, we have a director, so Pejon Zhang has an in-house research group. We also, as Beamline scientists, have the possibility to run our own research programs. But that, yeah, we'll <laughs> maybe when it, maybe when it gets less busy and we get more people, that will happen. But um, we're also meant to be a kind of a hub for integrated structural biology. We're lucky that we have CCPM on site. Um, we're involved in INEXT and obviously EMDB. We do run training courses, so we've had a few. Um, data, well, the first one was this data collection course, and then we've run uh, three iterations of our sample freezing course. Our last one, which was, yeah, two weeks ago, I think. So, um, the microscope time, uh, so 80% of it goes to external users. So we have in-house time for us for doing some of our in-house projects. We've just made a change to go more to a, a beamline system. So the the kind of initially when we started the main access that we granted people was rapid it was called rapid access which meant a 48 hour uh, data collection um the problem was is that this wasn't particularly rapid because we were doing kind of uh collating them every 3 months so it just took a while for people to get time so we now now that we've got other um ways to get access we've basically going to make change this back to what it should be for Beamline. So this is now going to be peer rev well reviewed by Beamline staff instead of peer reviewed. So it should mean if you apply to EBIC, you should be able to get an answer much faster and potentially get your time within weeks rather than months. Um, so we also have the crystallographer's favorite uh, block allocation group. So this is what most of the synchrotron um, access is run for for uh, MX Beamlines. Um, so this is where you have a group of people who apply together and they're given multiple um, sessions over a two-year period, which is reviewed six monthly. And at the moment, this is about 50% of the microscope access that we give is on this now. So we're up to 12 bags. They vary in size. But what we're also trying to do, again, mirroring what they do with MX, we have a super user training is this a training? Is it an accreditation scheme? I don't know. There's, we're still discussing that. So what we're trying to do is to take people from the bags that we have and basically accredit them to use our microscopes. Prior to this, all of the microscopy was done by the beamline scientists. So people would bring their samples and we would do the microscopy. With uh, the super user training program, we're hoping that that will lessen the load on the beamline scientists, allow us to do what we're meant to do, so some of the some actual research, and um, it, yeah, it will also give us some trained users for uh, when we roll out the uh, remote uh, data collection. We also have just recently started this EBIC for industry, so we have the fifth cryos, which is a collaboration with Thermo, and this will be dedicated to industrial users. So this will take the industrial users off our for existing crisis, so it should mean more time for academics. Um, yeah, based on scientific excellence and diamonds, T and Cs, the great thing about it is if you get your travel and subsistence covered if you're in the UK, so you can come to diamond and get fed, so you get 
I think 24 quid a day or something ridiculous like that. So you can eat quite well here at Diamond. Hotel thrown in and all of that. Um, for European users, so they can um, get access via iNext. Um, that's also been tidied up recently, so we've got a much clearer um, route for how projects get to us, how we review and then allocate time. And again, so this pays for people to go to Diamond. So. Um, so the facility itself, so we still, this is my uh, colleague Alistair looking very studiously at uh, Cryos 1. So um, this is uh, the first Cryos that we got delivered, so it's still actually sitting where it was delivered to, which is right by I-11, one of the beam lines, so they still love us. They thought it was going to move when we got the new building, but yeah, it didn't. So um, it's still there, it's still collecting data. We now have a new facility, we've got, well, new two years, a year and a half. We just had another opening anyway, so it almost feels new, right? So um, so we've got sample preparation labs in there, we've got um, some, a general lab, and we've got a few smaller microscopes, which I'll show later. Initially, our main room here was constructed for two classes, but as soon as the building was built, they knocked it down again, because they now found money for more. So we've got the one cryos in the ring and then four in this room, so. I think it was Alistair who had this idea when he went to the sea, what, why can't we stack them? And then with um, FEI, they designed the room. So we've got pretty much the minimum column to column distance. So, and they work, so it's all good, it's all good. Um, so one of the nice things about working on the synchrotron is, you know, you can start to take some of the things that they do and apply them to microscopy. So you can see these nice vacuum filled lines. So this is the autofill system. I know they've got one in Stockholm, so we weren't the uh, the first on that by any means, but we now have a system that, keep, uh, that allows us to keep our microscopes cooled without moving dewers. At the moment, we still have the dewers in there, but that's more for the dry nitrogen for venting the autoloader and column. Uh, we did try the nitrogen system that we have in the building, but that was a little too uh, wet, shall we say, so your auto loader would contaminate much faster than if you use one of these cylinders. So we also have, you know, the smaller microscope, which, you know, it's still a 200 feg with an auto loader, so that was the best microscope when I was training. Now that's just, that's something you screen on, you know, it's, it's, it's the, the less good microscope. Um, it has a Falcon 3, you know, Volta face plates. It's got all the stuff on it. It's used for mainly for training, in-house stuff. So, you know, we're, I, I want to put some samples into the fib. So, you know, two cassettes, 24 grids, just to make sure I've got cells before they go into this fella. So this is our cryo fib. So we still have this Martin Reed, Martin's Reed stage on it, platinum GIS. We have the quorum loading system still. We haven't done the upgrade yet. So, and that suggests, well, from conversations, maybe we don't want to either, but we'll see about that. Um, so, yeah, that's running. And what I should say is I think it's next week we have our first commissioning visit. So we're getting some external users to actually, they're going to have three, four days on the FIB with um, one of our Beamline scientists. And then we're going to run a craft session and see what they get out of it. So we have a control room because obviously there's not a deal of room downstairs to actually sit by the microscopes anymore. So we have positions for all of the crosses. Our Talos is here. So we've got a couple of users here. And so this is Abe from Thermo who's, who was our app specialist that week. Um, so this is nice. You know, you're, you're remote from the microscope. We have got the, the fiber remote control. It works really well. We've not had a problem with it. The only problem we did have was because somebody trod on the fibre downstairs in the room and killed it. So we had to replace that stretch and that has uh, fixed any issues we've had. Um, Cryos One's even controlled from this room and that's 400 metres away. So we've got direct fibre running along the tube from the main synchrotron. So that works fine. Uh, we've got support PCs by the microscope. And the, you know the benefits are is that you're not disrupting the microscope environment by having you know, we've got four systems in one room. We still have multiple users turning up, plus your beamline scientist. That's, you know, 12 people plus in a room. It's not, not so great for the environment. Uh, this is another one which 
yeah, Diamond is fixated with health and safety, as most places in the UK are, so they were very happy that we're now remote from the big dangerous microscopes and we're sitting in what is effectively an office with computers. Um, and we have workstations so the on-the-fly processing can be monitored. So I'm going to go about this by showing you we're not actually offering remote collection yet. So this is something that is planned. This is something that they do on the MX beam line. So I'm going to go through the system from the, from the start, including some of the like scheduling and all of that. And I'll kind of show you some of the differences and what we're planning to do. Um, so it all starts with this, the user administration system. So this is how we schedule the microscope. So you get your proposal accepted. The proposals appear in our in our administration system. We schedule them within uh, uptimes. So it, within the synchrotron run calendar, these yellow spaces are shut down. So the synchrotrons tend to have regular shutdowns for maintenance. Um, once the visit visit's been scheduled, um, so what users can also do is when they put their proposals in, submit preferred dates. So we try and avoid that. Um, then we'll assign one of us as a local contact and the way the synchrotron works is your local contact is the person you speak to about your visit. So if you want to know anything or you want to do something, the local contact is the person to speak to. Um, and then once scheduled, that kicks off uh, a bunch of other things. A uh, bunch of other things. So we have a dedicated user office who sort out your travel, accommodation, access, food, everything. We have, and it sets off all of the directory structures and archiving. So once once that's been scheduled, you will receive an email. You'll go into your the UAS and you can set up your visit details. It's pretty straightforward. You can do an online safety test. You can basically put um, you know who's coming, and this is important because this. Uh, sets the access to the data. So if you want somebody who's not coming to Diamond to be have access to your data for processing reasons, you need to put them on this list and just tell us that he's, they're remote. And then they'll have access to the... Because everything is controlled by federal IDs. So to get into the system, you will have to have a federal ID. So you it's, you know, username, and password, everything is controlled by that. So all of our... And all of our directory structures are protected by that. So you're given a unique code, it's, a, it's on the diamond system and the only people that can access that are you and the beamline scientists. So nobody else can, so it's, so yeah, it's good to get that. Um, we can also deal with samples so they can be validated. Um, we started to make some changes, so this is one of the things that we asked for, which we've got, so we can get some prior knowledge of what the experiment might be, you know, tomography, because trying to keep up with getting new staff in and kind of trying to get them trained to a level where they can support all the visits. When it was me and Alistair, it's fine because we've been doing this for long enough that we can do pretty much most of the types of data collection. But some of the newer staff aren't necessarily familiar with tomography. They're not necessarily familiar with serial EM. So we had a couple of occurrences where people would sit down, particularly from our next visits, and go, I want to do, you know, faceplate face plate, uh, dosimetric with serial EM. Uh, and you've got somebody who's been you know, he's, he's done single particle data collection, it's a bit of a problem. So we've implemented this to try and avoid stuff like that. Uh, we have, we have, um, once that's set up, then you have access via your Fed ID and password to this experimental management system. So this is shared between us and ESRF, um, which allows you to set up your shipment, dual shipment. So this is all done on the web. Um, it's very nice because it means you don't pay for your shipper being sent to Diamond. It also now works from anywhere within the EU, so Diamond will pay for your samples to be shipped, which is nice. Um, and, you know, it, it has a tracking system, so you get emails when it's picked up, you get emails when it's delivered, you get emails when it's on the beam line. So there's lots of advantages. At the moment, it doesn't work, it's not meant to be used for containment level two samples, but that will, I'm sure, be sorted out soon enough. So one of the things that we don't do yet, which we're, I'll, what we're planning to implement is, um, so with MX samples, they generally get shipped in pucks. So each puck contains a pin which has you, your crystal of whatever protein it is you've got. So on the MX, you can do this for sample registration. So you can 
have a DUA, you can add containers to your DUA, you can then label all your proteins, and this is going to be important for remote work because we're going to, because in the end, your your local contact, your beamline scientist, is going to have to basically take your samples and put them into the microscope. So, the more information that we have, the less mistakes that are going to be made. And this is super important for MX guys because they do short shifts. They have hundreds of samples. You know, it's two minutes for a data collection, so they can shoot a, a hell of a lot in a day. Um, and so, yeah, this allows the, them to load, you know, PUCs into the automatic sample loader. And so we have, you know, unique barcodes for Dewars. I think even some of the PUCs are for MX are barcoded. So there are lots of things that we're probably going to rip directly from them just to make our life a bit easier. So then the remote connection, this is all done with uh, M with NX. So this is a little, this is a video ripped off their web page. I had to find which beamline scientist from one of the MX beamlines still had the video. It was put on YouTube and I don't think anybody remembered where it was. So, so you've got no machine. You need no machine installed. So it allows you to open up a connection to Diamond and then from there. So this is just all the blah blah nx.diamond.ac.uk continue password yep so this is where yep okay so connection to diamond and then this is where it'll ask you for your username and password so the nice thing with this system is that what you can do is based on when your visit is you can gain access to one of the workstations on the beam line within a time window of your visit being active. So maybe a couple of hours before your time starts and a couple of hours after. And when you can do that, you get an extra option where you can see the beam line workstation, which you can then log into. This is just going through some blah, blah, if you don't see the right desktop. So, um, yeah, virtual desktop again. So, yeah, so that's the workstation. You can also obviously access other machines this way. So once you're on to the workstation, then you can launch the control software for doing the MX data collections. So it's GDA, generic data acquisition. Um, so, yeah, so through the IO4 launcher. So this is the same kind of thing that, w that we do as Beamline scientists to log into our machines, and this is probably what we'll be rolling out. So, so yeah, this is the front panel of GDA. So you start that, you've got these, they're called perspectives. So you've got the sample, so you control the, you know, the, the robot loading what samples when. You've got your alignment, you've got data collection. This is a fairly important panel, so this is a little extra. This is the baton, so this is a piece of software that allows anybody on the beamline to know who's actually running the beamline at any one time because there's obviously multiple computers, so multiple users per session. So if you're green, you are in control of the beamline. This has a messaging service, and basically so users can message each other and say, you know, don't you think it's about time you gave me control of the beamline? My time's here. So that's how they... And then, you know, they want to basically find their crystal, set up the data collection parameters, and then go away and shoot. So for us at the moment, so we have, yeah, we have the USA, UAS registration. We've got the visit details. We've started to populate that with things that we think we'll need. We can do the Jewish shipping. Sample registration, not at the moment. So um, hopefully we will, I mean, it should just be updating the pages, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, remote connection so f and beamline control for staff, we can do that, not for users at the moment, but uh, yeah, I don't see it being an issue. So again, we can go to this page. So what we're about, what we're about to do is we've gone to a PUC system that we're using internally, so we went for the sub-angstrom system. So hopefully what we're going to do is, I think sub-angstrom are going to send us some some of the travel pucks, which we hopefully are going to distribute to the bags, and we can try that with the bags. So they send us in the pucks, then we can put this on the web page. Um, yeah, so that's I think part of the plan, and then that should be the first start to allow us to have a sample registration, so we can put samples into the microscope. Then at the moment we are 
we are doing exactly the same thing so we're we're going into the support PC through Annex so um, as staff but Annex can have multiple groups so we just need to do the same thing we're going to start trialing this at the moment on the Talos um, where we um, have this kind of window for the current visit to allow us to directly log into the support PC for us this gives us full access to the microscope and detector PCs through VNC connections I'm not sure we necessarily want to do this for, for everyone I mean for us I think we would probably roll this out to the super users who would be trained users anyway so it wouldn't be such of a problem but I think for maybe for general users we'll have to think about that um, at the moment all that the users can see is basically the on the post processing so we use Scipion and uh, I spy B again to monitor sessions um, so yeah f f for users for the future yeah I mean this this control we can have controlled access with the Fed ID and user schedule they already do that on MX that won't be a problem um, a baton control system um, I'm not sure whether we'll need it initially but obviously going forward it probably makes sense if we're going to start to go to shorter visits because detectors get faster for example we may want to consider that um, we're also going to have to have things like staff override, so um, I'm reliably told that we can do that with VNC connections. So um, this is another thing we might want to think of, so switching our microscope into the user account, particularly I think with the new, the new server versions, they're going to lock most of the alignment things out for a standard user account, so people won't be able to mess with column alignments when they shouldn't be. Um, and then if you're really going to ideally what you want to do is just show them the data collection software so you know EPU2 is about to um, incorporate what Serial EM has been doing for a while into it so it's going to allow you access to the auto loader and grid mapping it's also going to incorporate I think auto CTF as well so that should so you're kind of part of the way there I think with the newer server versions as well with Sherpa and I think that will make all of this easier. I mean, you can do some of this with Serial EM. So, I mean, we are going to start trying to do this fairly soon. As I say, the first test is going to be done on the Talos in the near future. Um, so, I mean, this, yeah, and Diamond's doing this for other things. So, um, you know, we've had some good user results. So, we've got some nice structures out. All looks very nice for the funders. Um, and so this is the so this is the people. So Pajun's obviously the boss. Um, we've got Katie, who's our coordinator. Me and Alistair, uh, senior EM scientist. And we've got Jason, who does the industrial, who's just been joined by Rishi Matadian. So he's now seconded to Diamond. We've got Josh, who's here, who's looking after the computer side of things. Then Pajun's got a couple of postdocs, Yengi and Adriana, who are helping out with. Um, sessions at the moment and then we have three beamline scientists so James is looking after our fib Yuri and Andy are primarily on the cryos with me at the moment and then Corey who was our fib person who's gone to London uh, to have a good time and Kyle who's uh, gone to Cambridge to have a good time so and obviously there's lots of people at Diamond Dave the funders and also the Skippian guys um, who have worked quite a lot with us to get that working and I should also mention the Reliant guys as well and that's it done any questions or not I was wondering, um, f for your super users who can yeah. uh, work on the microscope by themselves, what uh, f for such a big number of users, how do you organize uh, when people are allowed to go there? Do you have like a golden rule in your booking system, like one session so at a time? or No, no, no. What we, uh, well, no, we don't do that. What we did do was have bag training. So we had them on site. The first one we ran for a week. So we've got one of our super users sitting over there, Dimple, I believe. Yep. So, um, 
so yeah we had people on site for a week and they told us what they wanted to be accredited for we ran through that and then if we were satisfied we signed them off so it, it's more it's not it's not just microscope use it's literally you want to do single particle so EPU with the K2 right okay that's what we're going to do you're signed off for that you're not necessarily signed off to use the Falcon 3 so we're going down that line we're going to have regular bag training sessions as well where we'll repeat this. We're also trying a little bit, because taking your microscopes out of the rotation for a week is an expensive way to do this. So what we're also trying is for some of the senior kind of people who come on visits is that, um, oh, we've got another super user, Natasha, as well. Sorry, I forgot. Um, um, is we're going to train, so they'll come in, and they'll basically operate the microscope with us. So we'll run through what they need to do. They'll ask us questions, and then we'll do that for a few sessions as part of their bag. Um, and we've had a couple of people who've tried, who've gone through that, and it seems to be. I mean, it it helps us out because they, in the end, we still control the loading. So we'll still load the microscope, but then after that, we can go and do other things. We're on the, you know, we're just down the corridor on the phone. Have you had any problems with PMC crashing or with heavy DNC usage crashing? Or nope. Nope. I know that was a rumour from the last server version. Was it 2.7, was it? That they thought that that was part of the reason why it kept crashing was VNC usage, but we didn't. I don't. That's a red herring. I think it was just detector. It, I think it's more to do with it dropping connections to the detector and with that particular server version it really didn't like that very much. Have you thought of any other options other than VNC? Um, I presume, I mean we could probably try NX as well, maybe. Um, I think TeamViewer is something else that so people use. Yeah. yeah. Um, at the minute we're kind of open to suggestions. We started with VNC and it works. I mean, my concern with VNC is it, it can be a bit slow. So that could get pretty irritating if you're trying to... I mean, I've done this from home, so we had a day where there was nobody could get to work, so there was too much snow, so we ended up setting up... I got in, managed to load, but then got home and set and picked squares and set up the most of the run from home. I mean, it's doable, you just have to be a bit patient. And so I don't know whether that's going to be a long-term thing. I did a 10-day session completely remotely, and about halfway through I was using VNC, and I got fed up with it, and I switched to TeamViewer. So it is quite different. So TeamViewer is faster, is it? Okay. That's interesting. I no think machine probably would be too. But... Uh, right, yeah. let's uh, continue this. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah sure, sure. Day, so maybe we can discuss this uh, maybe one hour. I did have a question. You have four crosses in one room. How are you going to yep. do if you get more crosses? Uh, <laughs> you're just going to tie yes. them up? Or? I, I <laughs> don't know. I think new building. Maybe? I think we think they're going to build an extension. I don't know. Maybe they'll get like a, a tent out the back. I'm not sure. All right. We, at the moment, we don't have any more room for crosses. So We've got a couple of rooms for other microscopes, but we'll see. Got to persuade somebody to give us some money for that first.